Good morning, everyone. I hope you are having a fantastic Friday. I'm here today with Vicky. Hello. And we're going to be talking about miscarriage and infant loss. Vicky works with um, bereavement and birth, and I'm a blogger. I have Kaboki, and I'm going to share with you about my miscarriage that I experienced two years ago. So, firstly, I just want to say I'm sorry about the quality of the video because neither one of us are techies. So, I wanted to go live and I wanted us both here, but I haven't quite figured out how to make everything really nice and pretty yet. So, hopefully, it'll improve each time I go live. So, yeah, um, my experience was that two years ago I had a miscarriage and it was pretty traumatic, as I'm sure most miscarriages are, because my um, my daughter had just started grade one and it was happened a few days after she started grade one. So I was still scrambling, trying to get the books wrapped, trying to get my head around everything that had to be done for her schooling. I was nervous about my child starting grade one, as I'm sure all moms are. And I landed up in hospital, school started on the Wednesday. And on the Saturday night, I landed up in hospital because I was in a lot of pain, abdominal pain on the right hand side. And I, I drove to hospital and I remember thinking, please don't let it be my appendix bursting because it was so painful. And on the right hand side, I didn't think it could be anything else. And when I arrived at the hospital, the doctor said she wanted to do a pregnancy test. And I actually laughed. I said, but I've been sterilized. I've had my tubes cut. And she said, look, we're just going to do it as a matter of course. And looking back now, I could see she immediately knew what was wrong when I walked in. And um, she did the test. And she told me I'm pregnant. And, you know, it's, it's funny how the mind works because I – I'm trying to figure out how to say this, you know, like I drove to the hospital thinking, please don't let my appendix be bursting. Please don't let it be my appendix. I get there, I get told I'm pregnant. And my mind just thinks, oh my God, how am I going to cope? How am I going to get through the pregnancy, the birth, the breastfeeding, the, you know, the, the coping with a newborn baby, the sleep, the expense, the this, the that. And I started getting this overwhelming panic. Um, I've already got two children. I've got a, a daughter and a, and a son, and both of them were surprises. So my daughter, I fell pregnant on the pill. My son, the loop fell out. And then when he was born, I had my tubes cut. So it came as quite a shock. You know, I love both my children. I didn't choose when to have them. <laughs> but, um, you know, everything's worked out well with that. And I just got this overwhelming sense of, like, I'm finally getting a grip on stuff. And then suddenly, like, I'm going to have another baby. But it took a while for it to sink in that why am I in the hospital if I'm just pregnant? And then I realized the doctor's still talking and it slowly crept in that like, okay, there's a big problem here. And I could hear the words ectopic pregnancy and she's trying to explain to me, but you know, it gets so overwhelming. And yeah, an ectopic pregnancy is basically when you're when the egg embeds somewhere other than the womb. The womb expands with the growth of your baby, but when it embeds, for example, in your tube, like it did with me, it basically, as the baby grows, your tube ruptures and your pregnancy is terminated. And on top of that, your life is in danger because you've got internal bleeding. So the pain that I had was my tube rupturing and the internal bleeding. And it's amazing that, like, once again, everything changes. Now I realize, Okay, I am pregnant, but I'm 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 losing my baby. <laughs> and I wanted to then, you know, everything within you suddenly says, but now I've got to fight for this baby. And I remember saying to the nurse, but and the doctor, but can't you just move it into the womb? Because I mean you can do in vitro fertilization, you can do all these amazing things with science. Why can't you just take it and move it? And she said, It's there's nothing you can do. And that overpowering sense of helplessness was it was, it was traumatic. It was intensely traumatic. And then I found out I have to have basically the same operation you have when you have a cesarean section. And they've got to remove the tube and the fetus and sort out all the internal bleeding. And I didn't want to go in for the op because my mind said to me and my heart said to me, but you're basically having like an abortion. And so it was almost like I'm choosing to get rid of the baby. But 
the nurse said, the doctor said to me, there's, there's nothing you can do. Your life is at risk. If you don't have this operation now, basically you're going to die. Um, you know, and as I was being gassed asleep, that feeling of absolute panic was overwhelming. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that came up for me. And funny enough, when my husband drove me home from the hospital a few days later, I remember thinking, you know what would have been really epic? like really nice, like an absolute treat, a burst appendix <laughs> would have been really, really cool. So, you know, all of these stuff is, it's just overwhelming. And there's a lot of stuff that's gone on since then. And it's been, it's been a really, really tough journey. And one of the things is that I thought I didn't have any expectations of how long it would take to heal but I never expected it would take so long because it still hasn't happened. I don't feel right. And you know, a few days ago, it was the two year anniversary of my miscarriage. And I can still burst into tears at the drop of a hat. I think about the miscarriage all the time. And yeah, I just, I can't, I can't get over it. And something that comes up for me often because I've shared about this on my blogs and I've written about it a lot and like I had, my family was complete. I didn't want any more children, obviously, because I got sterilized. But how do you cope when you are wanting to have a baby, you try for a baby, you fall pregnant, you know you're pregnant, you are looking forward to that life, and then you lose that. I mean, I had my own trauma, but I kind of, I'm kind of grateful for mine, in a way, <laughs> because I don't know how awful it must be going through all of that and then having that loss, it mm. must be just so much more. Yes. So yeah, that's my story. If anybody wants to, um, you know, comment or join in the discussion, you're welcome to leave a comment on Facebook. We can pick it up on the side and we can um, respond to you. So you're welcome to join in with the chat. Um, yeah, there was, there was a lot that went on for me as well because I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. I'm now 11 years clean so you know when I have an operation like a, a cesarean section I get paracetamol in my drip and I get panadas when the other women get morphine in their drip and they get mypridols when they come you know out of the operation so for me I had to deal with the physical pain the emotional pain and my coping mechanisms are not the same as normal people my coping mechanisms my automatic response is to do something like very unhealthy like falling over drunk or snarfing cocaine or something like that sorry it's a bit you know maybe a bit shocking but that is how i'm built and to have to go through that pain and not have anything to numb it was was really intense you know um and then you get hi anthea nice to see you we've got our first comment that's my cousin <laughs> um yeah it was it was a lot to cope with and something interesting as well is that when I started healing from the operation, it was very painful, obviously, but I was kind of wishing for something to numb the pain, but the emotional pain. And then when the physical pain cleared up, my emotional pain became worse because now I've got nothing to focus on. I've got nothing to, you know, the, the physical pain distracted me from everything else, if that makes sense. You know, it was, it was such a confusing, awful, awful time. So, I've made it through. I'm kind of coping now. I mean, I'm coping, but I, I don't feel whole. I don't feel like I've healed. Um, and maybe this is something I think you're going to bring up as well, Vicky, is that I kind of feel like I, I grieve alone. I said to my husband a while, quite a while ago, I said to him, how are you coping? And he said, but it didn't happen to me. I'm like, but it did. I mean, it's my body. It's our baby. You know, and it's, yeah. it's it's no reflection on my husband. He's not like a prick or anything, you know. It's just I think people grieve in different ways. People cope, especially men. Men cope in different ways, like cut off. And it's like when, when, when a person dies, like your mother or your brother or your sister or even your child, you have a funeral, people gather. Um, it kind of feels like I'm the only one left. Yes, when I was in the hospital, with the miscarriage, people gathered around me and all of that. But now 
I'm all alone. And the anniversary came on Tuesday and no one knows, no one remembers, nobody, it's not that they don't care, but it's it's my thing that I kind of feel at a bit of a loss. What what do you do with this stuff? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think a way to, I'm still thinking about it. I don't know if I'm going to plant a tree or have a tattoo or something to yeah. kind of memorialize what happened. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to yeah. hand over to Vicky now and she can tell you about what she does and give you some tips and lots of other information. Over to you, Vicky. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story with us, Lynn. Um, so I'm a birth and bereavement doula. So um, with bereavement is where you provide support and information with, to parents going through a loss or experiencing that. So some of the stuff that bereaved, we call it bereaved parents, they need safety. They need permission to acknowledge their feelings. They need to talk about their baby. They need to be around people that they can trust, that they can be honest with and vulnerable with. And they need to talk about their baby as often as they want to. Um, another advice is talk to a therapist, talk to a counselor um, to talk about what you're going through and find ways to release that emotion or that um, energy that you're going through. Like it could be a physical activity like punching something, doing boxing or running, or it could be painting or singing something more creative. And then join a support group to talk to people that have gone through similar stuff and that knows what you're going through and creating mementos for your baby um, like planting a tree like you said in memory of your baby or writing a letter to your baby and also to attach onto what you said um, stuff that you might experience is you're unable to see a future for yourself like thinking how can I go on um, without my baby regardless of what gestation you lost your baby. Um, and then you might be feeling depressed and alone because everybody else is moving on, the life is going on, and they don't want to talk about your baby because they don't know how to support you. And you might have feelings of guilt that your life is actually going on and your baby is not. So another thing that you, that you can do is you can write a letter to your baby to say, what you want to say to that baby and visualize or imagine you know talking to your baby and saying that stuff to them um other advice for mommies that are experiencing a loss is take small steps at a time break your day up into like say hours like one hour each and focus on something in that hour that is normal for you so for example focusing on feeding the pets or washing or doing the laundry just finding something in your way that is normal that can just bring about normal in the chaos that you might an overwhelmingness that you might be experiencing so friends that are supporting people going through a loss i know it can be really difficult to know what to say especially if you haven't ever been through something like that but the most important thing that you can do is just acknowledging the fact that they've lost a baby it's not a bunch of cells that they've lost if they lost the baby at five weeks. It's their baby. It's it's their child that they have lost. And just acknowledging that. So some of the stuff that you can say to them is, I'm here if you want to talk to me. I'm here to listen. Or you've been so strong you can lean on me. Or it's okay to cry and I might cry with you. It's okay to feel angry and frustrated because, I mean, you're grieving a person that you've loved. God is how long you've had that person inside of you. You're grieving a person that you've lost, and it's okay to go through all of these emotions. So some of the stuff that you should not say is stuff like everything happens for a reason, or it was meant to be, or at least you can get pregnant again, or you're still young, there's still a lot of time, um, or you need to move on, or you need to get over it now. That's not stuff that's helpful. That's not stuff that you say to a person um, that's going through a loss. If you don't know what to say, the best thing to say is nothing. Just holding them and being there for them um, is more than enough. And if you're currently going through a loss, it's important to tell people what you need, um, how they can help you. Because like I said, people don't know. They're awkward around this, this stuff. So it's kind of not your job to educate them, but tell them what it is that you need, asking for help and accepting that help. And if you're a person that's supporting them, 
ask the grieving person, how can you help them um, get through this? What do they need from you? And remember that grieving and pain looks different for every person. Every person is experiencing it in a different way. Um, what I found is a lot of people, they want to talk about the loss, they want to talk about the baby. They don't want to sweep it under the rug. I mean, society is so, like, you can't talk about a baby that you've lost in five weeks. I mean, for some people that might be, you know, what are you going on about? But for another person, that might have been everything. That might have been the only chance of um, parenthood. So it's really hard for them, and they want to talk about it. And I encourage people to talk about their feelings because it's not normal or brave or strong to not talk about your feelings. Talking about your feelings and expressing that is brave and it is strong. We don't have to hide it away. I mean, the pain is never going to go away, but not talking about it is not going to make it better for you. And the other thing is if they're siblings, brothers or sisters, and you don't know how to deal with them, tell them what happened. Be honest with them. Don't say stuff like, um, your baby brother went to sleep and God came and took baby away because you might create fear for that child to go to sleep at night. Um, asking them how do they want to remember their baby brother or sister. It doesn't matter if you didn't know the sex of the baby. You can, you know, what you felt like the baby were. You can say, how do they want to remember their brother or their sister? So five things that you can do to not get stuck in that grief um, so the first one that you can do is accepting reality. So if it is possible to hold your baby, to bath your baby, to dress your baby, if it's not possible, then you could just talk about your baby or like we said, write a letter to your baby. The second thing is express your emotions to give into emotions. If you want to cry, if you want to scream, if you want to hit something, then do that. Don't keep it all in. It, it's going to make you sick and it's going to make you depressed if you keep it all in. Number three is commemorate your child. So remember your baby. Give your baby a name. Even if you don't know the sex of your baby, like I said, if you think it, if you felt like it was a boy or a girl, give that baby a name. And then maybe take a lock of hair from the baby if it's possible. Hand and footprints. Take photos if you can. Have a funeral, like you said, for your baby. Even if you're unable to physically bury your baby, maybe you can bury like a teddy. A teddy bear you can just give a burial to the, to the teddy bear planting a tree like you said um keeping a journal making an album for your baby that that type of stuff i think a very a very nice one that i thought about as well but i can't do that because i've got nothing is um people make those pendants out of hairs or ashes mm -hmm. or breast milk or yeah. stuff like that you can actually get a pendant for a piece of jewelry made and i thought that's really beautiful but five weeks I don't have anything so I don't have anything to like I said then you can just you know you can take a teddy bear and bury that teddy bear just to have it some sort of closure um, yeah. or take a blanket from the hospital something just to hold on to um, when you yes. go out um, of the hospital and then also light a candle on your baby's uh, birth date or death date or due date or whatever just to remember your baby by um, so that's the, uh, for, uh, the third one. And the fourth one is to realize that having conflicting emotions is going to be normal, to maybe feeling guilty that they, they might have yes. been a day that, by that you forgot to think about your baby, and realizing that that is normal. It is okay to feel um, a bit guilty about that and not think about your baby in that day. And then number five is decide where you want to spend your energy. So there's three ways where you can spend your energy. The first one is getting stuck in the why me, why phase. And that is where you want an explanation for what happened. You want a reason for your loss. And the second one is getting stuck in the, the poor me phase. I mean, it's really hard losing a baby, but getting stuck in that poor me phase is eventually going to make that you lose friends as well. And then the third one, which is the most healthiest one, is accepting reality and moving forward. You're never going to move on. You're never going to get past the pain. You're just going to live to deal with the pain and to, you know, go about your day living with the pain because it's a hole in your in your life that's never going to be filled. Yeah. I mean, if you 
if you decide not to talk about your baby, that's not going to fill that hole. I mean, there's nothing that's going to fill that. So, yeah. you know, you, you learn to live with it. Um, and then also well, that's, the what, dad, uh, that's what Jackie said there in the comments. You need to kind of push through it. There's nothing yes. that's going to numb the pain. You've just got to push forward. And I've, I felt that very much as, as well. And um, thankfully, I've got two children. So there was a reason I had to get up in the morning for them. Mm. So they really pulled me through. Um, that was, I'm very grateful for that. And then a lot of times I think we forget about the dads or the partners. Um, I mean, like you said, men deal with grief in different ways. So they can focus more on stuff like returning back to work or something like that. Um, but they experience loss as well. And to encourage them to cry, to talk to someone about their emotions yeah. and to get, you know, give out into that emotions as well is, is really important to not forget about them. Well, well, I feel I feel the men often struggle. Well, how do I put it? Um, it's not that they struggle more or less, but they I think the men struggle to express themselves, they struggle mm -hmm. to open up, they struggle to cry. I don't have that problem. Yeah, I just I just let it out. So, you know, and I've had counseling, I've spoken to friends, I've put it out everywhere. Um, and that's helped me cope. I mean, mm -hmm. I could imagine having to keep all of that in and not have any outlet for it. I think he's struggling a lot more than me, but he can't recognize what it is. Yes. And I think that's really sad. Definitely. Yeah. They do. I mean, there's this stigma that men have to be strong um, yeah. and not crying. Crying makes you a man. Um, they're a person too. <laughs> they're just human. Definitely. And they have emotions. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to mention is just some general advice is to be kind to yourself. Look after yourself as much as you can. I mean, eating, sleeping doing exercise, maybe creating an event or something just to keep your mind a bit busy, but then also scheduling some time for yourself where it's just you and your thoughts and just focusing on yourself a bit as well. Talk to other people about your feelings and try not to keep asking why the entire time or just finding answers for for your loss because it might consume you entirely if you keep asking um, those questions. And just to be patient with yourself Everyone grieves in a different way. Don't compare your grief to anyone else. I mean, there's people that can lose a baby at five weeks and they're fine and they can move on. But then you get people that take months or years to get past that um, of losing a baby that early. So it's different for everyone. And like I said, just don't compare um, yourself or your grief to anybody else's. Um, so you can maybe the people that's watching in the comments maybe you can say um some stuff that people have said to you um that you know unhelpful comments that people said and the yeah, other thing i had a lot of those october is infant um, pregnancy loss awareness month so what i do is on the 15th of october you're more than welcome to send me a message or drop it in the comments your baby's name and whichever date you want to give me, whether that is birth date, due date, or death date, and I write it on a piece of paper that uh, is aimed with forget-me-not seeds. It's biodegradable, and I cut it out into little hearts, and then I release them um, on the 15th of October, and then eventually, in time, it will grow into little flowers. So you can do that as well. Oh, but that's yes, beautiful. It's making me all like... <laughs> But yeah. we need to talk about this. We don't need to sweep this under the rug. Um, it's not something to be ashamed of. Um, what I found is, or what encouraged me to become a bereavement doula is, um, especially in the medical society or medical settings, it's kind of like it's not really a baby that you've just lost, especially in the early early weeks. That's it's what like, people have said to me. They said, oh, but you, it's not a baby yet. It's... Yeah, it was, it it was is, it's a child. It, I mean, you get people that they're planning a pregnancy and they fall pregnant eventually or they struggle to get pregnant and then they get this positive pregnancy test and it's their whole life they're imagining what it's going to be like with the baby. Um, they, they're planning everything and then they lose this child at six or seven weeks and they haven't even heard a heartbeat. And it's just like, uh, you know... It's not really something yet, so 
You can just yeah. drag in it. It's so sad. It's so messed up that that is where we are. Actually Another at thing I was told, I was told, yeah, that it's not a baby yet. And then the other thing I was told as well is, but it's okay, you can have another one. And I'm like, mm. I don't want another one. I never wanted one in the first place. I had my tubes cut. I don't want another baby. Yeah. But I want that one back. That that I want. Yeah. So there's this whole, yeah, it's really, really messed up. Really but I mean, like up. you you got your tubes, your tubes tied, and then you might get people thinking, you had your tubes tied, you didn't want another child, so what are you going on about? I mean, hello, that, that's what a lot of people said to me. They said, oh, it's for the best. And someone even said to me, oh, you're so lucky. Imagine the financial saving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's not something that came into my mind. And I, I think mean, people, you, 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 you spoke about guilt. I have had to work through a lot of guilt because mm -hmm. I kind of can't reconcile everything in my brain because it's like I didn't want a baby, another one, and then I fell pregnant and then I lost it because I had my – if you if you have your tubes cut and they join – they fuse back together, you have a very high chance of an ectopic pregnancy if you do fall pregnant. Yes. So for me, it's like, okay, so because I had my tubes cut, that is why I had an ectopic pregnancy. So, yeah, I mean, like you say, you've got to work through the guilt and, and keep saying to yourself that it's not your fault. But it's, it's you know, logically I know it's not, but emotionally I've got to mm. kind of reconcile that. Guilty. Guilty. I'm um, just looking at a comment from Anthea. What advice do you have um, for me when helping someone who has had a miscarriage? Well, like I previously mentioned, Anthea, it's just acknowledging, number one, that they've lost a baby, being there for them, and telling them you are here for them. You will listen to them. They can cry if they want to cry, and just be honest in your presence. And if you don't know, ask them, how can I help you? How can I be there for you? What do you need from me? You don't have to fill in the the, the silences with something, just rambling stuff. Just sitting with that person. Yes, just yes that's brilliant advice. Um, I think you know, the, the people that gave me a bit of heartless comments, it's, it's not that they are heartless. I think people are so uncomfortable when they hear about miscarriage. It's such a loss and people don't know what to do. And then they truffle that silence and the stuff that comes out of their mouth is not always the best thing to hear. So I feel that um, just being in my presence and being quiet and not having to fill that silence is really, really important. Um, yes. so I think that's a, a massive, massive point. I mean, it's okay to sit in silence. We don't have to talk the entire time. It's okay to just have that, you know, emotional connection one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Definitely. It, it's that thing where, um, where less is more. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely oh, less is more. Something, just be there. And if you're really not sure, ask them. They will most probably tell you, I need to talk about my baby now, or I need to talk about my experience. So ask them what it is that they need from you. And just like well, Jackie said, do well, something normal and not talk about the baby. Just do something, go out to coffee yeah. or something like that. And I think. That's really important because, I mean, I went through waves of wanting to cry, wanting no one around, wanting to talk about it, not wanting to talk about it and talk about other things. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, everything changed. It changed every minute. And so, it's also important to, if you're the grieving person, to tell them, um, like you said, you don't want to talk about it, tell them, I don't want to talk about it right now. Um, I want to do this. So realizing your strength and your weaknesses um, within yourself first and realizing what you need at that stage and communicating that to people. And if you're not in the mood for people, tell them, listen, sorry, I'm not in the mood for people right now. And I'm pretty sure people will understand if you just communicate that to them. And if they don't understand that, then it's their problem. Yeah. I think something else I wanted to bring up that hasn't been covered that was, was quite a biggie for me is that I would be feeling kind of okay and almost like it's not on top of my mind at that moment and then something would happen that just crashed everything. Um, and things like that were like I'd be feeling fine, my phone rings and it's my auntie to she's heard about the miscarriage and I just burst out crying. Um, you know, and it comes from nowhere. It kind of it slams you. Well, slam me I and um, when I got my period 
my first period was yes. absolutely traumatic. Um, about three weeks after after the operation, my hair started falling out in clumps, which is a um, a pregnancy, you know, it's, it's a, a symptom after giving birth. Your hair starts falling out. But mm -hmm. I've got no baby. And yes. I mean, I was brushing my hair, it fell out for months. And every time I brushed my hair, I would be bawling, you know, and in the shower, it was, I mean, hair loss after having a baby is, is, is horrible anyway. Um, but when you've got nothing, when you've got no baby and you've got these symptoms, it's it's really bad. It's the same as people that uh, might have breast milk after the pregnancy. Yes. But yes. there's no baby. For that I didn't milk. have that. Actually. That would have been very upsetting. Yes. Yeah. Just, um, just realizing as well, they went through a pregnancy. <laughs> so the postpartum um, stuff might still be there. And that might yeah. be traumatizing for them. Very difficult very. to work. Uh, yes, I've heard that quite a lot. There was obviously something wrong with it, so it's probably based um, something abnormal in the cells. So you would have had, had an abnormal baby, stuff like that, um, which is not what you want to hear. She was very excited for deciding to do it. Just reading Marie uh, Kruger, her comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry, Marie. That must be awesome. incredibly hard to cope with. Is that two weeks ago that it happened? That's very, very fresh. I'm very, very sorry that for is. your loss. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us, Marie. Um, and don't mind if I cry, because whenever people share their stories, I cry. <laughs> yes, and that's okay too. I mean, it's you're human. It's part of the process. Um, There's more messages. Where are they? Just going to. Oh no, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that also made people really uncomfortable. Is that I just I just let rip. I cried and I cried and I cried. <laughs> People don't so, know what to do with emotions. It's like, uh, well, what should I do now? They, they're awkward. It's weird that yeah. we're not being taught how to deal with emotions. We're not. Um, yeah, but I think that goes for, for most people. I, I've got, um, it's quite an asset that I gained during rehab. I, um, you, know, you sit in groups and you learn how to be silent in very uncomfortable emotional situations and also um there's a lot of crying that goes on in rehab so yeah i have been taught how to cry freely and how to kind of be comfortable around people that are emotional and crying so for me it's 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 something that i can handle but i know for for most people it's it's very uncomfortable and just like the experience that you went through in hospital how you are treated in hospital, how the, the nursing staff or the medical staff makes you feel. And that also plays an enormous part in how you will process this birth it's, um, or miscarriage or what it is that you went through. I mean, if you haven't received support um, and you haven't felt like this major thing, you're going through a major thing, it really influences how you deal with it um, later on getting you know being depressed depression about just like with everything in birth and bereavement as well the process and how people treat you is very important at least it leaves a very lasting memory well I, I was treated nicely in hospital but i found the whole hospital experience traumatizing in itself as well because in that because it was a miscarriage i was put in the the labor ward and the birth so and and the room i was put in was obviously the high risk room so i had just had my operation and there was a woman next to me that i think she was um it was a difficult labor and i think she was in the process of losing her baby mm. and you know so like i've just lost my baby and i'm listening to this and i can hear women in labor and there's stuff going on i can hear babies crying um yes you know, i have to be in there for a few days and I had to walk around and start healing, but you're in the labor ward, you know? Um, and I, I, I get that that's where I need to be because that's the medical thing that I had.
but it would have been so nice being in the general ward or somewhere else. Well, that is where um, we as, as bereavement doulas could ask the nursing staff or the hospital if, if there's some place more private that the mommy can be moved to, um, yeah. you know, separate from, as you said, hearing other babies cry and moms going through um, stuff and you hear without your baby, but you have to listen to all of this. So, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a lot of stuff. I mean, it just everything came in all over. So, yeah. Cool. I just want to see if there's any more messages. I think that's it. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to share, Vicky? Or anybody else want to ask another question or leave a comment? Just um, as I said, um, I'm always here if you need to talk to me. My page, um, I'm always open, literally like 24 7. Um, so, I will answer and I will listen to you and you can talk over and over and over about your baby. I will not get tired of listening to you talking about your baby. And then you're more than welcome to give me the names of your babies uh, with the dates that you want on there and I will write it into um, the little hearts with the uh, forget-me-not flowers in it and then release it on the 15th of October. Oh, there we go. There's a message from Jackie. Oh, I'm so sorry that you experienced that. That must have been, you know, and I think, I, and this is something, you know, like I spoke now, uh, you know, I had, the, I had nice staff, but I had trauma in another way with, um, you know, having to listen to a woman next to me, um, struggling with her labor and, and being in, in, in a high risk situation. But I think, you know, you have the loss and then you have your trauma upon trauma upon trauma. Like I had an operation. I couldn't have decent medications. I had that physical pain. I had, um, you know, so much stuff going on. And then you've got Jackie that on top of having a miscarriage, she got treated badly. So, you know, that that's not the time for that sort of thing to happen to you. It, it really just feels kind of like unfair, like you're getting battered nonstop. People need to realize the process that you're going through, that you are a mom busy losing your baby or a mom who lost her baby um, you, be, having kids that is alive doesn't make you mom being pregnant and having that regardless of how long baby inside of you one week two weeks three weeks you're a mom and you lost your child you lost your baby and that needs to be acknowledged it needs to be you know just they need to well, be treated better it's not it's not well, that's it. You know, I, I never had, like I said, I've had two unexpected pregnancies, well, three. I've had my two children that were unexpected, and then I had this this um, loss that was unexpected. But I was completely overwhelmed and shocked at how, when I found out I was pregnant and losing it, how I I wanted to fight for that, for that life. Um, you are a mom. As soon as you find out yeah. you're pregnant... You, I mean that 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 is incredible. That feeling was so massive. Um, yeah, I think it, it doesn't matter how early on you lose your baby. You, the loss is so huge. Um, our natural instinct as moms is to protect our children, um, and we want to do everything in our power to keep that baby. And searching for answers afterwards, and looking for fault or reason inside ourselves why it happened. Um, if you get pregnant again, um, they tend to, you know, think about stuff that they might have did wrong and trying to avoid that, or they might white knuckle their pregnancy. Like, just I just want to get past two weeks, past three weeks, past four weeks, and then get past eight weeks, and then if we get to twelve weeks, everything will be fine. Um, and twelve weeks is also not a magic number. Anything yeah. can happen at any stage. Um, well, I think yeah, because. I mean, I, I I don't know what it's like to have a miscarriage and then a baby, but I I I had such fear of having sex after losing my baby because yeah. you know, like the doctor said to me when when he, when he, after the after the operation, they said they removed one of my tubes and the fetus, and I'm like, but you left me with one cut tube, and he said, what's the chances? I said, pull baby, loop baby, sterilized. And an ectopic pregnancy, and I'm left with one cut tube. Yeah. I'm I'm scared. I, I'm 
you know, every month, even now, if my period's a bit late or something doesn't feel quite right, I get this intense anxiety. So I can yeah. only imagine what women must feel when they're trying for a baby, they have a miscarriage, and they try again and they fall pregnant. I mean, that yeah, I, I can't even begin to, to yeah, it's just too much. I, I don't know how people go through that. Um, Jeanette, uh, thank you for your comments. I'm really sorry to hear about um, your loss. I don't know if you catch what I what I said previously. Um, and Anthe as well, you can give me your baby's names. Um, even if you haven't picked a name for your baby yet, you can still um, pick a unisex name or whatever you felt like your baby were. And you can give me those names and I will um, write it for you um, and do the heart treatment yeah. piece. Jeanette, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, and I found that a lot of the women I've spoken to, I, I actually wrote a blog post on my website 10 days after my miscarriage. It's pretty raw and emotional. Um, but I had a lot of response. And, and I was overwhelmed at how many women do experience this. And it's you know, they say, oh, it, happened. it happens to almost everyone. It, it does happen to almost everyone. It happens yeah. to, I think, one poor woman. But that doesn't yes. mean it's something you can just, oh, it happens to everyone, brush it away. Yeah. It happens exactly. to so many women and it's so painful. And that is why we must talk about it, not brush it away. It's, and I mean, it, it, it's all backwards to me. It's, it's, it's hard to kind of take it all in. That if it, um, like she said in word, it um, happens to almost everyone, it's not going to make the pain better. It's not going to make it go away. If it's that common yeah. and it is that common, then we should do better. We should know by now how to deal with this. We should be okay with talking about it and not trying to make it off and brushing it off as nothing. Um, it really doesn't matter if it, if it happens to almost everyone. Um, yeah, it's it makes it even worse. We need to speak more. Yeah. And then another one. Just let me find that. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. You know, it makes such a difference being able to speak to someone. In fact, I think it was towards the end of last year, I contacted Mandy from Pregnant in Cape Town. Um, she's also had a, a miscarriage and written about it in her blog. So we started chatting kind of, um, you know, on Instagram and Facebook messages. And it's really helpful. It's been very helpful for me because she's the first person I asked. I said to her, you know, it's been, it's been nearly two years at that stage. And I said to her, is this normal? Am I supposed to still be crying over my miscarriage? And she said she feels like she's got post-traumatic stress disorder. And she's still struggling as well. It takes it takes a lot of time. And I think, you know, the best people I think to speak to about miscarriage is people that's that's gone through exactly what you've gone through. So yes. a support group, I haven't found a support group, but I'm, the whole web is my support group. Um, but I, I talk a lot about it and you know, like Vicky said, I'm also open and, and happy for people to inbox my page and to chat to me about it. Um, I'm quite comfortable with pain. So. And also a lot of times, like we said, it's been two years and you're still struggling. A lot of times after two years, it actually peaks. So um, well, you might experience the most intense emotions around it, which is interesting. People would think it's like the first part, but it's... Um, it's different for everyone. So really when does it peak? At two years. Oh That's really? It. Yes. Okay, so so this is this is it's normal. Normal. You're okay. not weird. You're not the only person experiencing that, um, and it's important for people to realize that, you know, having conflicting emotions is normal. It's natural. Um, yeah. You're grieving well, a loss of a child. Yeah, it's interesting with the expectations because I said to my mom a while back, I said, I didn't have any expectations of when I should heal. Um, but I feel that I should have been further along. And she said, but then you do have expectations. So, yeah, it's it's very conflicting. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, I see the rest of your um, your story you've shared with us. Um, yes, and like you said, having a chance to um, see and hold your baby 
Um, I know it might be weird for some people to think about um, looking at my baby or taking photos of my baby, but afterwards, um, I still encourage you to do that because afterwards, they actually want to look at that. They want to look back at their baby. They want to hold on to something from the baby. Um, so if that is possible for people in any way, please do that, even if it feels a bit weird for you at that moment. But it is really important to look back. And I mean, you want to rem remember your baby. They don't want to be forgotten. Um, yeah. It is your child. So you want to look at your child. Um, that must be so hard having to give birth as well. I, yeah. You know, for me, um, I was okay. At, no, I wasn't okay at the hospital. I was I was traumatized and, and scared and, and everything. Um, and one of the worst parts for me was when they said, no, they want to do a scan. And I thought... Luckily for me, it was too early for them to even pick anything up on the scan. But I just had visions. I know what it was like with my two children having scans where you see the baby come up on the screen. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. And I, I just I lost it. I completely lost it. I, I thought I'm going to see a baby up on the screen. And if that happens, I'm just, I'm just going to break into a million pieces. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to be able to pick myself up again. Um, and they couldn't see anything. So... Yeah, um, but it's, you know, there's, there's so much. It's, it's different for everyone. Um, there is some people that don't want to see that, um, and that is fine as well, but most of the time, afterwards at least, they would want something yeah. to look at. Well, now I feel that. And I, don't, I don't have anything because I don't have any baby things left. There was no scam. I mean, I... For my two children that I have, I've got um, I've got my hospital I've got a memory box and I've got a hospital memory uh, you know the hospital cards I've got the yeah. little bracelets the tags from me and my children I've got my pregnancy test cut and pee yeah. in my memory box so I, I didn't even know I was pregnant so and it was so early there's nothing mm. there's so for, I, I kind of I, I feel like there's just yeah, it's just this kind of a ghost thing going yes. on for me. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I struggle with as well. And I mean, if you had something like just an ultrasound to look at or something that you can just, you know, bury or I think yeah. that might make it a bit, you know, you have something to hold on to to look at to make it a bit more real that it actually happened. And experiencing all of this is normal um, because... Yeah. Here's the proof, basically, that you went yeah. through. I'm probably going to go with a. I'm probably going to go with a tattoo on my wrist. There's one with a beautiful branch, and then you do your family members. So you, I'm going to do my husband and me as birds, and my two kids, and then you do the bird flying away up your arm. And I thought mm. that's really beautiful, that and is. I might get that. Um, but it's it's a tattoo which is permanent, and it's a, you know, it's a it's a it's a big thing for me. So I don't want to rush into it, but that's probably what I'm going to be doing. Um, just picking at Anthea's comment. So are you looking for, I mean, I'm pretty sure if you search for bereavement doulas in London, you will be able to find some um, on Google or there's support groups that they can join that's online. Um, you can have a look at the website um, Still Birthday. Um, or now I lay me down to sleep. Those are websites that you can have a look at. Um, yeah, the still birthday is S T I L L birthday. Um, it's a really nice website to for support for people. But I'm pretty That's sure they're in doulas. Yeah, it it they say every birth is still a birthday. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Awesome. I don't know if we've got any more questions. Uh, ladies, if you have any more questions, maybe just pop them on the page now. Um, otherwise, if you watch this video at a later date, uh, Vicky or myself will come and, you know, just reply to all your comments. And I'm going to come and just reply to all the comments a bit later on today as well. First, I'm going to have a cup of coffee and have a bit of a breather because it's quite emotional sharing you know, um, this is the first time I've done a video of my miscarriage. I have only written about it. So it's kind of 
brought up a lot. So I'm going to go have a cup of coffee and have a bit of a breather, and then I'll be back, and I'll come and engage with you ladies shortly. Well, thank you very much, Lynn, for inviting me. And thank Pleasure. you, thank you for, for coming. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Um, I know I, and I'm pretty sure Lynn, truly appreciate you guys sharing that with us and being so open yes. and honest. We need to talk about this more and be more, you know, bold about our births and losses. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great. And everybody have a wonderful, fantastic weekend. I'll catch up with you soon. Bye. Bye.